The history of Ireland's criminal underworld stretches back a long way, with many notorious figures rising to prominence and shaping the nation's criminal landscape. Among these figures stand two notorious names, John Gilligan and John Cunningham. Even in the brutal underworld of Dublin's gangland during the mid-1990s, the murder of the 37-year-old crime reporter stood out as particularly cold-blooded. Veronica Guerin was shot dead in her car at lunchtime on June 26, 1996. Her killers had followed her from the Nace District Court in County Kildare, where she faced a speeding charge. When the younger mother stopped at an intersection, a motorcycle with two men pulled up beside her. The passenger got off, walked up to her car, and fired deadly shots at close range using a Magnum revolver. The killing shook the very foundations of the city. John Gilligan was the prime suspect for ordering the murder. Although he denied having any part in Guerin's death, he openly admitted assaulting her when she confronted him outside his house the year before. More shockingly, he admitted to making sinister calls to her mobile phone, threatening to kidnap and rape her six-year-old son, Cajal, as a twisted tactic to scare her off from probing into the sources of his wealth. In 1996, British police arrested him at Heathrow Airport in London with a suitcase stuffed with 330,000 Irish pounds in cash as he tried to fly to Amsterdam. He was extradited to Ireland and stood trial in Dublin in 2001. Surprisingly, he was acquitted of Guerin's murder, but got sentenced for drug trafficking. He served 17 years of a reduced 20-year term and was released from prison in October 2013. John Gilligan is a man whose life journey took him from humble beginnings to the dark underbelly of organized crime. Born as the first of nine children on March 29, 1952, Gilligan was raised in Ballyferma. At 14, he left school and started working as a cabin boy on Irish ferries. His first run-in with the law came at the age of 15, when he faced charges of larceny. He married Geraldine Matilda Dunn when he was 20, and six months later, their first child was born. But despite the responsibilities of fatherhood, Gilligan stuck with crime, delving into truck hijackings and robberies. During the 80s, Gilligan transformed into an organized crime figure as his gang, known as the Factory Gang, specialized in raiding warehouses and stealing valuable cargo destined for supermarkets and factories. However, in 1987, Gilligan's career as a thief came to an end when he was caught stealing sweets from the Rose Confectionery premises, resulting in an 18-month prison sentence. In 1990, he was convicted for another robbery and was sentenced to four years. Upon his release from Port Leach Prison in 1993, Gilligan ventured into the thriving drug trade. Within six months, his first drug shipment arrived, 75 kilograms of cannabis resin concealed in two wooden boxes. Over the next two years, Gilligan orchestrated the importation of a staggering 21,000 kilograms of cannabis resin using a freight company in Cork. This cannabis was sold to Dublin criminal Brian Meehan, later convicted for his role in Veronica Guerin's murder, at a rate of €2,530 Euros per kilogram, earning Gilligan a gross profit of about €20 million, Euros, with additional income coming from contraband cigarette sales fraud and arms smuggling, potentially amassing a total of 30 million euros. Despite this period, Gilligan portrayed himself as a respectable entrepreneur and professional gambler. He even flew so frequently in first class that Aer Lingus granted him a gold card. Gilligan's family lived a life of luxury, enjoying everything from upscale vehicles to the Jessbrook Equestrian Centre, houses and cars. The scale of Gilligan's operation left law enforcement officers stunned Operation Pineapple, a guard or offensive against Gilligan initiated in early 1996 before Guerin's murder, uncovered the staggering wealth he and his gang amassed. They were practically drowning in cash, smuggling vast quantities of cannabis into the country by the container load. Gilligan's wealth grew to such proportions that he had to employ individuals solely to count it. Weekly tallies of up to 100,000 Irish pounds were carried out by a family from South Dublin. The full extent of Gilligan's operation came to light in March 1996, when Dutch police alerted Interpol to suspicious money laundering activities by Irish nationals. Investigators unveiled that Gilligan and his gang had laundered millions through currency exchange bureaus in Amsterdam. British authorities seized substantial sums of cash from Gilligan's associates. In Ireland, confidential reports from banks revealed that hundreds of thousands were passing through accounts controlled by Gilligan. 
leaving investigators baffled by the sheer scale of his operation. However, the investigation into Veronica Guerin's murder prompted legislative actions leading to the formation of the cab to seize ill-gotten assets. But despite the newfound focus on his finances, Gilligan's substantial fortune remained elusive. He invested a significant portion of his wealth into the Jesbrook complex, which he bought for 1.94 million euros. In addition, he spent 214,000 euros on extra land, just for the horses to graze on. Eventually, Cab seized and sold the estate, which had been transformed from a run-down house into a world-class equestrian centre. In addition, some of the money was laundered by gambling. He placed bets totalling 6.7 million euros between 1994 and 1996. He won back 6.09 million, effectively laundering the cash at a cost of approximately 610,000 euros. The Guardi believed that vast amounts of money were smuggled to Amsterdam, where at least 3.42 million euros was converted into Dutch guilders before being deported into offshore accounts, vanishing without a trace. It was also rumoured that Gilligan had hidden money and firearms in a bunker on his Kildare estate. However, despite various searches, the bunker has remained elusive. Following Veronica Guerin's murder, bank accounts under Gilligan's control were emptied, with some of this money being intercepted and confiscated. Intelligence gathered by the team investigating Guerin's murder, as well as subsequent efforts by CAB, indicated that Gilligan had funneled significant amounts of cash to Spain through Liam Judge, a criminal from Kildare who had since passed away. Some believed that a portion of the missing fortune was laundered by Terry Wingrove, a British associate of Gilligan's who deposited millions into Hanover Bank Limited, an offshore depository registered in Antigua, but operated from Dublin. However, only a fraction of Gilligan's vast fortune has ever been found. When Gilligan was released from prison in October 2013, he returned to a changed island and found himself the target of two assassination attempts. On December 5th, two armed men were looking for Gilligan with the intent to kill, but ended up at the wrong pub. The next year, a couple of gunmen did find him while he was attending a family celebration at his brother's house in Clondalkin. Gilligan was shot at least four times and rushed to the hospital in critical condition, but miraculously survived the shooting. Two weeks later, while Gilligan was still in the hospital, his driver-slash-bodyguard Stephen Douglas Moran was shot dead. After Moran's shooting, Gilligan was discharged from the hospital under armed guard or escort and promptly left the country. In 2018, Gilligan was arrested as he tried to board a flight to Spain with more than €22,000 in his suitcase. The following year, the case was dismissed and Gilligan still left for Spain. However, he couldn't enjoy the Spanish sun for long. In 2020, he was targeted as part of an international investigation into his criminal gang, suspected of trafficking drugs and guns from Spain to the UK and Ireland. During a joint operation involving Gardi, Spanish and UK law enforcement, his mansion in Alicante was raided and officers found four kilos of cannabis and over 10,000 sleeping pills. But that was not all. Officers also found a rare Colt Python 357, which they initially thought was used for the murder of Veronica Guerin. Irish police later ruled this out. The then 68-year-old Gilligan was one of six people arrested, but got out on bail in December 2020. He recently dodged an eight-year prison sentence in the case. Following a plea bargain, Gilligan was only handed a suspended 22-month sentence and a fine. Remarkably, the charge of being part of a criminal gang was dropped. In the wake of the recent court trial, Gilligan was expected to come back to Ireland. However, the controversial documentary about his life, Confessions of a Crime Boss, sparked outrage and distress in Ireland, so he now appears to have no intentions of returning. The whereabouts of Gilligan's elusive fortune remain a haunting mystery to this day. One of Gilligan's former associates is notorious gangster John Cunningham, another Irish veteran who built a drugs empire in Holland before going into the narcotics business with Christy Kinahan in Spain. As a young guy, he started his criminal activities from robberies to extortion. Money and power were the only things he was interested in, and he was ready to do anything to get there. On the way to that, he made a lot of connections in the criminal world through which he became famous, and is considered one of the strongest guys in this area. Cunningham's moniker is Colonel, and he put in a lot of effort to reach that nickname. Irish criminal John Cunningham has been found guilty several times of kidnapping and importing illegal drugs. He was born in Ballyferma, which is an Irish suburb of Dublin in Ireland. In the 1970s, he and his brother Michael participated in a number of armed robberies and maintained close ties to Martin the General Carhill, 
Born on May 23, 1949, Martin the General Cahill passed away on August 18, 1994. He was a Dublin-based Irish criminal lord. He was shot and suffered fatal injuries while on bail for abduction charges and planning many burglaries and armed robberies. Cahill's murder was attributed to the Provisional Irish Republican Army, although no one was ever detained or legally convicted. Most of all, he liked to rule from the shadows and avoid all the front pages of the media. But that was not Cunningham's only link with the criminal world. As time passed, he found more and more connections. He wanted to make contacts because he knew that it would be difficult to reach his goals alone. It finally paid off for him. As he expanded his circle of friends, he steadily climbed to the top of the food chain in the criminal elite. Second one was Christy Kinahan. Christopher Vincent Kinahan Sr., also known as Christy the Dapper Don Kinahan, was born on March 23, 1957, and is an Irish drug dealer with charges for ecstasy and heroin illicit trafficking. Christy Kinahan's longtime colleague, John Cunningham, served as his number two during the Operation Shovel campaign against the gang in 2010. He had been photographed at the time while being restrained when the Spanish authorities started their extensive investigation into the operations of the cartel on the Costa del Crime. One of John Cunningham's most famous crimes is the kidnapping of Jennifer Guinness. She was an Irish socialite who was of English descent and a member of the Guinness family. In the 1980s, Anthony Kelly, John Cunningham and his brother Michael were involved in the abduction of heiress Jennifer Guinness and they received significant sentences for their crimes. They planned this operation for a long time and invested a lot of effort. A lot of sleepless nights, a lot of planning, equipment and money went into this. All with one goal. That was extortion. They wanted to take the ransom money, but it wasn't all about the money either. With this work, they would get even more on their criminal career. They closely followed their victim until they reached her. They followed her every step and just waited for the right time. When it seemed to them that the right moment was here, they did not hesitate for a second to grab her. Their kidnapping victim did not expect that, but thought that her day would pass like any other day. Nobody expected that to happen. She was relaxed and enjoying the day, but then it happened. Jennifer Guinness was kidnapped in 1986 from her home in Howth, County Dublin by a group of four men commanded by the Cunningham brothers. A ransom of over £2.5 million was requested from her husband, John Guinness, the chairman of Guinness Marne Bank and a relation of the famous brewery family. Garder officers searched abandoned barns and residences throughout the nation for the prisoner for more than a week. Most of them thought that they would never see her alive again. Hope was drastically declining. Those closest to her could not believe it. All this seemed to them like a nightmare. They were in shock. They wanted to do everything just so that this would not end tragically as it does in most cases. As time went on, it seemed less and less to them that she was still alive, but the glimmer of hope was still there. Until one moment, one police call would change everything. They received information that the police had sorted everything. They have them. The group was ultimately traced down to a residence on Waterloo Road in Bowlesbridge, Dublin. Jennifer was rescued by Guard D after a siege at the house she was kept. The kidnappers surrendered after a brief exchange of gunfire and extensive negotiations. But the ransom was not paid and four men were convicted in relation to the kidnapping. Michael Cunningham was sentenced to 14 years in prison for his role in the scheme, while John, who was a year younger, was sentenced to 17 years. After the capture, they did not cause problems. They realized that the plan had come to an end. They pulled out the thick end in this move. While serving this sentence, John Cunningham crossed paths with Christy Kinahan in Mountjoy Prison, who was serving time after he was caught in a Fairview apartment with a load of heroin in 1986. The years they spent together, planning their actions for hours and hours, would prove vital for their future, as similar aspirations made them to become very close. Michael Cunningham, John's brother, tragically passed away in 2014 from a natural cause. In January 2015, John Martin Foley, and Troy Jordan attended his brother Michael's funeral at the Church of Our Lady of the Assumption. In late 1996, John escaped from Shelby Abbey Prison while expecting an early release and went to the Netherlands, where he got deeply involved in illicit drug trafficking. Cunningham and Kinahan Sr. started importing drug substances. By that time, Kinahan had moved to Amsterdam just before the introduction of CAB, so they were reunited in Holland, and business was blooming. They developed a $50 million illegal narcotics business. Cunningham and his family were staying in a luxurious property with a pool close to Skipple Airport. 
However, Christy Kinahan got arrested a year later and was sent to Port Leash Prison. Cunningham continued to run their empire from Amsterdam on the outside. Huge amounts of money from ecstasy dealing in Ireland came in and were brought back to Holland and exchanged in Gilders. It is estimated that around that time the gang was responsible for 60% of all Irish pound to Gilders transactions in Holland. At one point, a shipment of automatic guns and 800 kilos of cannabis was uncovered in Ireland, which could be linked to Cunningham. Therefore, his mansion was raided by the Dutch police in 2000, and arms and money were found. Also, a ledger was found, which revealed that around 31 million euro worth of cannabis and ecstasy had been sent from Holland to Ireland while Christie was in jail. Cunningham was convicted and got a seven-year prison sentence. After serving four and a half years out of his seven, he was deported to Ireland where he served the remainder of his sentence for the abduction trial at Limerick Prison. He was freed from prison in 2007 and relocated to Tala before relocating to the Costa del Sol in 2009. He moved with one purpose to the Costa del Sol, and that is to work as Christy Kinahan Sr.'s right-hand man. As we can see, it's very difficult to survive in their criminal world. All of them build friendships between themselves because then it's easier to deal with other problems and tasks. The road to it is extremely difficult and many try to reach the top. But almost always, something unexpected happens. Something that many are not ready for. If you like this video and want more content like this, hit that like and subscribe button. Leave us a comment about what you think about this criminal and who you'd like us to investigate for you next. Thank you for watching.